started out in poverty, but my kids, they, they've got a better life than I did. I was bullied as a child, but now I have a whole tribe of people who support me. And I didn't get good grades in school, but I was one of the first people in my entire extended family to earn a Bachelor of Science degree from, from the university. And I've lived with chronic pain for most of my life. But I was able to overcome that, and I still maintain an active, healthy lifestyle. I know trauma and hardship. I take a lot of pride in getting things done whenever challenges arrive, and I take a lot of pride in celebrating wins despite whatever challenges arise. I am a strong person, or so I thought. I used to work, 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 and I, I'd never take a day off. So when people would complain about being tired and busy, I'd be all like, oh, well, I've got this project, and I've got this volunteer work, and I can figure it out. I can do it. If I can do it, and so can you, right? I used to push and push and push through sickness, through nausea, through nerve pain. And when someone would say that they weren't feeling well, I'd be like, oh, how can you take a sick day? I live with chronic pain my entire life. Figure it out. If I can do it, so can you. And <laughs> I had a very difficult time when I was going through my separation with my husband several years ago. And we've been friends since college, so when we went our separate ways, it was really hard. I was depressed, but I still showed up. I still got things done. I figured it out. If I can do it, so can you. Does this sound like somebody you know? <laughs> there I was, just going around, just throwing this strong, independent woman complex around at everybody, right? Judging everybody else based on my personal experiences, based on my worldview. Going around, just letting my ego, trying to prove how competent I was to everyone else. And then the unthinkable happened. About a year and a half ago, I got a phone call that changed my life forever. I lost a tribe's name. And until then, I thought I knew trauma. I thought I was strong. And I realized I didn't really know anything. And anyone who's suffered an incredible loss can, can probably relate. My whole world stopped. I missed deadlines. Suddenly I couldn't get anything done. I couldn't show up to work. I couldn't figure it out. And I needed to ask for help. And I needed to ask for empathy, for compassion, for understanding. And while my case is an extreme instance of a wake-up call, you know, my friends, my team, my family, they've been an unimaginably supportive for me. It's my grieving process. I mean, without their compassion, I really don't think I could stand here today and give you this talk. In the professional world, I've encountered people who behave how I used to, you know, bulldozing, pushing, right? Indignant, insensitive, they're, they're, they're judgy. And, and maybe some of you have known somebody like that. You know, we've seen this translated in the tech community, but by uh, uh, the programmers. Um, you know, the programmers are mad at the sales team. The, the sales team is frustrated at the project manager because they think it's, it's scope creep. And, and the front end designers, they, they have zero <coughs> patience for the engineers, right? The team in one country, they're blaming the team in the other country. As a result, product delivery gets stalled, right? We're all caught up in our emotions, our egos. Everybody believes that their way is the right way. Can't we all just get along? <coughs> the good news is that unless you have a debilitating condition, we're all built with the tools to combat this issue. We all have a secret weapon right in our back pocket. We can tap into it at any moment. And today I want to encourage you to tap into that secret weapon, to lean into what makes you more human, to cultivate the communication skills required to ask for help when you need it. 
to try to see it from another person's perspective, to find ways to cultivate more empathy in your life. The data tell us that people who feel connected live happier lives, and I believe that it begins with empathy. My name's Christina Aldon. I have a digital advertising agency based in Las Vegas. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm lucky girly girl everywhere on the interwebs. Today I'm going to talk to you about you know, what em empathy is, what empathy isn't, the challenges that it presents, and I want to talk about ways that you can cultivate more empathy into your life. So I want to say thanks to Antarctica and thanks to all of our sponsors. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Empathy is the feeling that you understand and share another person's experiences and emotions. It's the ability to share someone else's feelings, basically. And I like this graphic, how to become an empathist. Empathy is one of the 26 traits of emotional intelligence. It, it falls into the awareness of others category. I speak about emotional intelligence a lot. And, and empathy is just one of those, those facets. And when we're designing and, and developing products and services, we can, we can try to understand our clients' worldview by putting ourselves into their shoes. We build better products, better services, when we can empathize with our customers' values. We can create better work relationships by empathizing with our team members. So today I'm going to talk about ways that we can do that. And so part of emotional empathy, part of empathy is, is emotional empathy, affective empathy. And this is the, the ability to read our own and others' emotions. So someone lacking emotional empathy might be somebody who is a psychopath. That's an example of somebody who might not be able to really share in the feelings of somebody else, but, but they, can, they can understand them. And then the other part of that is cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy. This is the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. So someone who's lacking cognitive ability might be somebody on the, the autism scale, right? So you might be able to um, uh, have the emotional reaction, share in the feelings, but you don't really quite understand why somebody might be having a response. And research at empathy, it, it tells us that uh, bad moods, bad moods can spread on social media. So if, if we think about that, if we think about that, if something on social media gets us upset, it can influence our own mood. If you're happily just kind of scrolling through Facebook and you see a post about politics or something, well, that can kind of change your day. You might get angry. They to tell us that, that emotions can change our, our state of mind. And then we, we modify our own feelings. That's, that's, you know, influences how we perceive somebody else's feelings. And I want to talk about how empathy is not sympathy. Empathy connects us. Empathy is where we find that connection with another human being, where sympathy can sometimes come out as, as, as you know, trying to uh, silver lining something. Sympathy can, can sometimes um, uh, separate us because you, you maybe want to you wanna fix it for somebody. That's not empathy. Empathy is when you kind of sit in it with somebody without trying to fix it, without trying to silver lining it for somebody. Right? Every silver lining has got to touch the gray. Grateful Dead, one of my, one of my favorite, favorite songs. But sometimes when we try to sympathize with somebody, we might try to you know, try to find something hopeful in, in this miserable situation, which I, which I get, but really, oftentimes, the intention is actually to make yourself feel better because you're uncomfortable in somebody's difficult scenario, right? So the best thing for empathy, empathy says, you know what? I don't know what you're going through. I'm not sure, but you don't have to go through this alone, and I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to hold space. You, you know what I mean when I say hold space with somebody? You just kind of sit there with them in it without trying to fix it. That's what empathy is, you know? So if sympathy, if we're having some, some issues, you, you might come off, you might say something insensitive, like, you know, oh, oh, get over it, you know? You don't need that 10X developer anyway. You, you, you've got some other developers, you're good. Nobody wants to hear that, right? Oh, sorry, sorry you slept through your keynote, you know? Well, at least you got some sleep. <laughs> 
the last thing that somebody wants to hear, or they missed an opportunity, or they made a mistake, right? Because what you're not doing is you're not acknowledging their feelings. You're not giving them time to process those feelings in a healthy way. And this, this is how we can be a little more sensitive. Um, you know, when, when, when we think about, for example, somebody who is, is really trying to dismiss that, that awkwardness, you're trying to smooth over it, and, and that's not really empathy. My friend, Steve Andrews, he is an uh, advocate, speaker, and author. He talks about toxic positivity. Who can tell me what toxic positivity is? Toxic positivity is when people say, oh, well, just get happy thoughts. <laughs> sure, I'll just be a problem. Let's just switch that, right? Toxic positivity is when we try to encourage people to just kind of only think happy thoughts without really, really processing the emotions and acknowledging them. What people truly need are comfort, validation, acknowledgement, and support today. And, and, you know, it just sets ourselves up for failure if we, if we go around trying to uh, think about, oh, you know what, just choose to be happy. Oh, complaining never helped anyone. You know, these are, these are difficult phrases to process when, you know, you're grieving or when you're upset or you're, you're having trouble with, with your job or your work. Happiness is a choice. Who's heard that before? Happiness is a choice. <coughs> Happiness, oh, okay, well then I guess it's my fault. I'm choosing to grieve and woe is me. What am I thinking? Oh, good vibes only. I like that one. Good vibes only. Oh, you know what? You'll make it through. Just just keep trying. How about this one? Everything happens for a reason. Toxic positivity. It's not always helpful. Well, well I understand that sometimes people might be trying to be cheerful, or, or, or help people, it's really not all that, that helpful. Um, and in fact, you know, studies tell us that, that chasing happiness, it, it actually causes us to obsess over not happy feelings and makes us more miserable because we're trying to be happy. Because if you're trying to be happy, then that must mean you're not, right? Because I'm trying to be, so that must mean you're not. So, you know, things that you could say instead you could say things like, ah, that's awful, difficult, hard, right? Without trying to fix it. It's an acknowledgement of the other person's emotions. How about, I'm so sorry. How about, you matter, and I'll show you with actions. In the last year and a half, you know, especially right in the middle, right at the beginning, in it, people would say, oh, you know, just call me if you need anything. <laughs> I can't even use my phone right now because I can't peel myself off the floor. So the best, most helpful people were the ones who just brought over soup, the ones who just came over and said, hey, can I take the kids to the park? Hey, let me do this. Showing people with actions is a really good way to show empathy. Another thing is to say is, I don't know what you're going through, but you don't have to go through it alone, right? That's okay, you don't have to fix it. But you know, here's the thing. We want that connection, right? Remember, people who feel connected, they live happier lives. So we want relationships. We want to belong. We want to matter. And in a polarized world, I, I think we really need more empathy now more than ever. Our culture, our judgments, our personalities, our, our fears, they all impact our capacity for, for empathy. And so. Well, we may not always have control over our thoughts, we can choose to act on it or, or to not act on it, you know? Um, uh, our thought comes right into mind and, and our memory usually is, is automatically triggered, our thoughts are automatically triggered. But listen, millions of thoughts pass through our minds each day. So, so the ones that have the strongest neural networks and, and emotional intelligence tells us that if the signal is strong enough or repetitive enough, this is how it, our, our neural networks are formed. We can cultivate more empathy toward others instead of just reacting, you know? Figure it out. If I can do it, so can you, right? Empathy is, is no good without that intentional action. So if, if we feel the need to help, if, if, if we're stimulated to help, we, we have to take action to help. It's helpful. And it seems like a, 
Captors. You know, in our brains, we automatically have these, these, these chemicals, oxytocin, vasopressin. They naturally help us bond to other people. We're social creatures. And so, you know, you, you can think about even biochemically that we are wired to empathize and, and, and how we, we get these oxytocin boosts. Oxytocin helps us with bonding. Vasopressin helps us with uh, taking in new information. This helps us with productivity, with our loyalty, with our engagement. According to this workplace empathy monitor, business solver put out this uh, uh, research. They were talking about how empathy has a direct impact on employee productivity, loyalty, and engagement. So we see this at work, not just in our personal relationships, because oftentimes people think we need to be caring and empathetic to, to the people that we love. Okay, that's great for our tribe, but what about the people that we work with? What about our clients? What about our customers that we're serving? And the good news is, is that even though our intelligence is fixed at birth, our, our emotional intelligence, things like empathy, it can be cultivated. We can, we can become more empathetic just by practicing a few more things. And you know, HR people, we, they know this, 92% of them know that a compassionate workplace is a major factor for employee retention. And even though they know that, 64% of, of people within the last year have experienced bias, they have experienced uh, workplace uh, uh, prejudice, even though we know that it's not helpful. And that it, it comes from a place of not understanding, of, of really not empathizing with people. And most people say they'll leave without it. They'll leave a workplace and it makes it really, really hard to keep a team if the office is not empathetic. So the thing about empathy is that practice makes perfect. Remember why I said that if the signal is strong enough or repetitive enough, it strengthens our neural networks. We know that from emotional intelligence. So we can practice. We can practice empathy. It's, it's not just good enough to intellectualize empathy. You've got to know it. You've got to feel it. You've got to take action. And so we should try to inject little bits of empathy into, into how we interact with our colleagues, with our clients, uh, with our users, and, and, and parts of this, of course, um, there come challenges, right? You can't measure empathy in the workplace. That's really hard. Uh, there are certain KPIs that, that we can break down, um, but there's no direct measurement for empathy in the workplace. So it's hard to talk about sometimes and, and get your managers, your bosses, uh, people on board with, why do we even need empathy? Also, empathetic distress is a thing. Empathetic distress is a thing that actually reduces empathy because it's that feeling of being overwhelmed and then we want to shut down. We see this sometimes in certain professions like, like healthcare, doctors, surgeons, and, and empathetic distress is, is it's a protective mechanism for people when, when that overwhelm comes in. The other thing that happens is prejudice, right? If it's taken to the extreme, empathy can turn into prejudice. So, you know, oxytocin, remember, causes us to bond, and we can be really, really extremely more caring to our own tribe. It's easy to do that, our own group. And then, of course, what that means, that creates an us and a them, right? So take it to the extreme, uh, that can happen. And burnout. Boundaries are really, really important. We have to take care of ourselves. Burnout happens um, if, if we're so so uh, set on taking care of other people and, and always turning that lens outward. The other thing that's a challenge with empathy is that we love dirty laundry, right? We love gossip, especially when it's not our own, right? And when we're more connected to people, we have the inside scoop on people, right? When we're more connected people to people, we have access to more of their shortcomings. And, and, and their faults and, and their personal drama. So we have to learn how to not get all caught up in the drama, excitement, and distract us from our, from our own journey. Another thing which I, I thought was interesting while I was researching this talk is that uh, a challenge is that we have more independence 
these days. There are so many more tools. Um, there are more people than ever living along in their own isolated uh, uh, little lifestyles, right? We're creatures of habit. And so um, more than ever, you know, uh, there, there are more independent people and we're feeling less and less connected, especially in big cities. In smaller towns, this is a little easier. Um, everybody kind of knows your business. There's this more intimate. But in larger cities, not so much. And most of us these days, we're living in larger cities. So here's some tips that you can start using right now to start strengthening your empathy muscle, to, to lean in to what makes us more human. And these are the ways that I've learned to cultivate more empathy in my life. It's, it's helped me form deeper relationships with others. It's, it's helped me in designing products and services for my clients. And um, I, I hope that you get better results as well if you practice these. Hmm. So the cool thing about humans is that we have this, this critical thinking capacity. We, we feel, which means we into it. So we pick up on things like sarcasm, intrepidation, nervousness, right? Deception, insecurity. And, and we can cultivate more awareness in others by picking up on their facial expressions. So if you just tune in to somebody's facial expressions, uh, that, that can help. Um, most of us, 36% of us apparently, 36% of us are not really good at identifying specific emotions. Isn't that interesting? Right? I mean, even me, before I started like working with emotional intelligence stuff, uh, things were mad or sad or bad and happy, and that was about my range. <laughs> Everything else kind of, well, are you frustrated? Well, are you, you know, learning how to identify those emotions uh, in other people and in yourself is going to really help you empathize with them. Another thing we can do is we can look at body language. Body language is something like 92% of what we communicate. So oftentimes when, when I'm talking to my mentees or my coaching clients and, and they're having some communication issues, I say, well, think about what they're not saying. What is their body language saying? Right? What would have happened if she said, ladies and gentlemen, Christina Aldon, and I came up and I said, hey everybody. I'm Christina, right? <laughs> My body language is telling you right then and there that I'm not excited to be here. <laughs> so body language matters, and it's, it's usually uh, most of the signals of communication that, that we're communicating to other people. The other thing we can do to cultivate more awareness of others is to listen to the intonation of their voice. We've heard this before, right? It's not what you say, it's how you say it sometimes. Anyone who's been around small children can, you know, a, a grumpy child, pretty much you can just pick up anything and as long as you're reading it in a storybook voice, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> the child doesn't really care what you're reading because it's a storybook voice and it's story time and they know and they can kind of calm down and soothe. I've done that with my kids before. Oh, I don't even know. Let's just pick this up at the doctor's office and here we go. Here's an interesting story because the intonation matters and, and those are the kinds of communication signals that help us. If, if we tune in and we really listen, it helps us to create more empathy in our lives and improve our communication. The other thing we can do is we can tap into what's naturally built in. We have mirror neurons. So um, again, this is implicated when oxytocin is released. And, and it means that we see something happen to someone else who, who might look like us and, and our brain kind of links us to them. You know, we're, we're more compassionate about it. And remember, this taken to the extreme can, can cause prejudice. So we have to be careful. We have to question what our biases are, might be and, and what our blocks might be. This is why it's important to have diverse opinions, diverse uh, people, points of view in your tribe, in your, in your circle of influence. Because, you know, if somebody that is scared, you know, we, we can really identify with them. That's great. However, if somebody's scared about something that we can't even relate to, uh, whatever. You're one of those others. You're one, right? And so thinking about what kind of, of, of 
uh, struggles that somebody else is going through and thinking about what kind of, of negativity or what kind of reaction that might invoke in you is helpful in creating more empathy. And, and empathy, on the other hand, of course, is it's hard to get from people that we don't identify with, right? We're biased against people who look different than us, who, who live a different lifestyle than us, uh, they, people who have a different gender. We hear this from women, right? You'll, you'll see a man complaining about, oh, oh, my back, my, oh, well, you think that's bad. You should try childbirth, right? And while that's kind of a, a candid, funny gender, I mean, taken to the extreme, this stuff is really dividing our country, our groups, our corporations. So I think that um, tapping into mirror neurons and, and thinking about where we might be biased in, in that is, is, is really helpful. Our unconscious bias, our, our, our inherent bias, our systemic bias. That's a whole different talk altogether. But, you know, empathy can shut down um, if, if, if we're dealing with somebody who we can't really relate to that, that doesn't look like us. Remember empathetic distress, right? Another researcher that uh, I read about, you know, they found that anxious and depressed patients who suffer from an excess of negative emotions, they're more likely to focus on their own problems. They're more likely to be isolated. And so um, empathy was found to be reduced when people were exposed to negative movie clips, for example. Um, this, this tip comes from my director of communications at LG Designs. Uh, he, he, I, would, I would have a difficult time, I would, I would be having a difficult moment, I would be having an anxiety attack, and his tip was to focus on something beautiful. Wherever you are right now, what are you doing? What do you see? What is beautiful? We gotta balance those thoughts. It's almost like, you know, when you're, 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 you're <laughs> barely treading water and you're exhausted and you start to uh, fall down and sink in the icy cold. You, you take these little tiny sips of, of air, these little sips of beauty, right? And it helps balance out our thoughts because otherwise it's really, really easy to see that everything is crap. <laughs> it's really, really easy to see it when, when it's in it and it's hard to focus on those beautiful things. It's hard to, to think about well, you know, I have my health. Well, I have my children. Um, I have food. I have shelter. These are, these are things that we can think about. Maybe it's, it's flowers. Maybe it's just the sun shining on our face in that little brief moment. If we could take these little sips of beauty and these little sips of life, it helps balance out our thoughts and, and, and it helps balance out all, all the other stuff. Another thing we can do is we can apologize. The best apology is changed behavior. That's what I always say. The best apology is changed behavior. And we have the ability to, to apologize and, and course correct, um, catching correct, as my life coach says. So, you know, don't just go break the build and then apologize to the team and, oh, sorry, everybody, you know, we're here on a Friday night, we're working late over on the weekend now, and then do it again next weekend. <laughs> it's, it's not really an apology, right? The best apology is change behavior. And, and by showing somebody that you apologize, taking accountability, you're, you're showing that you empathize with their scenario. You're, you're showing that you empathize with what your actions did and, and how it caused them pain or discomfort or to stay and work the entire weekend, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and then on the extreme level, of course, we have, we have people who go around and they apologize all the time, right? I used to be a chronic apologizer. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not even Canadian. I, but, uh, you know, it, it, if we could show that we're accountable for our actions, that's one thing. But, you know, on the extreme level, um, uh, overly apologetic, is, it, it's really unnecessary. It's, it's guilt and shame that you're kind of putting putting on yourself that that's not really healthy either so there's there's a gray area and there's a wide wide range between those those two extreme extremes and um, I know for for some people apologizing can be hard apologizing and, and having that accountability can be hard the other thing that we can do to cultivate more empathy is to just pause 
to just pause and to just breathe. I have a, a tendency to dissociate from my pain, right? Something happens and I kind of cut it off and I go, oh, okay, whatever, cauterize that wound, we're good, excellent. Nothing to see here, right? <laughs> we are just fine. It's nice and easy, right? Who, who wants to feel all that pain? But at the end of the day, if we actually kind of lean into that pain and, and, and understand what the underlying feelings and, and triggers are around that, what, what is that activating? You know, if I've learned anything in the last year and a half, it's that the only way out of a bad situation is through it, through it. We can't go around it. We can't go above because what happens then is we dissociate. We're really kind of pushing that pain down and, the, and that underlying cause has never been dealt with. So if we can pause, um, you know, strengthen our empathy muscle just by going deeper into that feeling, into that emotion, um, you know, it, it helps us cultivate a little bit more empathy, a little bit more intuitive intelligence and, and, and understanding for, for empathy. And being sensitive is hard. I get it. You know, today we have lots of distractions to desensitize us from communicating with others in an open and, and honest way. But pausing, even taking a 60 second breath before we respond um, can really help, help create empathy. This is my mom. We, we went on this uh, uh, Grand Canyon trip and together and uh she she came to visit and then we were cruising through the grand canyon i, I had this uh little black car in, in the desert in las vegas i said i was from las vegas and um it was like right in the summer we're driving through the desert and uh my car is kind of soaking up the sun and it, i mean even inside it was getting a little heated i'm sitting there talking to my mom talking to my mom Talking about my sister pretty soon. Uh, my sister never comes to visit me. Now, no, now, never mind that, you know, I hadn't visited her, but she doesn't come to visit me, and I want her. And why not? Why doesn't she just come? I can help her get a job, and I, I, I want my, to see my sister more, and I'm, I'm just going on and on and on and on. And, and, and my mom's, yeah, mm, mm, right? And then finally she said, why, why are you judging her? How, how she lives her life. I'm not judging. <laughs> That's what, I'm not judging. And I, I heard my voice and I got quiet. <laughs> and she said, if there's anger, there's judgment. <sighs> my mom, ever the wise woman. And she was, she was right. She was totally right, right? So if you find yourself pushing, bulldozing other people, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by incompetence. I'm surrounded by idiots. What, what are you thinking? What's wrong with you? Mm, actually, you have to kind of stop and look at the common denominator in those conversations. And, and usually it's you, right? So, you know, one, one way to bring more awareness um, is to just check in and see if you're judging and, and, and see if you're attached to the outcome, if you're pushing, you're bulldozing, as opposed to uh, taking an inquisitive approach, a, a curious approach, uh, asking questions. Uh, it, it can be much more helpful and, and effective. We can be vulnerable. Vulnerability trips the empathy switch, you know, and so usually a situation where somebody's being vulnerable that that can bring out empathy in people. Humans, they respond naturally to to vulnerability. So if I stand up here and I tell you that I'm nervous, most uh, most people can say, OK, yeah, I get that. I can I can relate because I know that most people is like 98 percent of, of the population is afraid of public speaking. Right. So if I stand up here and I'm vulnerable and I say, oh, I'm nervous. People inside automatically kind of go, oh, yeah, okay, right? They want to cheer for you. It's all right. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying let's just sit around and hug all day and, and sing kumbaya, but, but I am saying when it's appropriate, when it's appropriate, be vulnerable. It's okay to be vulnerable. If somebody's opening up to you, if somebody's having a hard day, hey, man, I'm running to Starbucks. You, you, you want a coffee? Somebody is, is really chewing on a problem and, and you see that they're frustrated, you know, maybe just walk over and say, hey, you, you want to go with some air? Simple things like that can, can add more empathy and it can really bring that connection to, to another person because it's really easy to go, oh, 
that person's frustrated. You're throwing a fit over there. All right, I'm going to avoid you. I'm going to leave you alone. I don't want to be around you. In fact, that kind of isolates that person, right? And it's not really helping them process the difficult feelings when they're already having a difficult time. Yeah. So being vulnerable, um, uh, it, it can be really, really helpful. The other thing that I tell people is to study, become a student of empathy. If you need more empathy in your life, just lock it in. You can read some books. There's a, The Empathy Effect. Emotional Intelligence 2.0 is, is a book that I recommend to everybody because it's, it's helped me and, and so many of my clients and my, my coaching clients and my mentees. Um, but, you know, read, read about as much as you can about empathy for three whole months. Read opposing views, read, read similar views, read blogs, read magazines, all of the things. And just really become a student uh, of empathy. And, and that will help. The last thing I want to leave you with is, is to communicate. To communicate with empathy. Lots of times we don't do that. And lots of times it is, unfortunately, in the tech world that I see that. Right? So we say things like, why do you have an attitude? Instead of saying, hey, is something bothering you? So much different. Your body language, your intonation, right? how you're saying things. It, it, it's important. The other thing that you could say, you walk in, what's your problem today? <laughs> how about instead, are you having a bad day? How can I help? We can, we can be a little more empathetic in the way that we're communicating to people. And, you know, team leaders, managers, it's important also to let people know what the consequences are of not communicating. What are the dangers if we don't communicate? What happens to the team? What happens to the build? What happens to product delivery? Um, maybe if somebody isn't even communicating, what, what can happen within the culture, right? So these things are important to, to be aware of, especially if you're in a leadership position and, and how you are, are communicating because not doing anything can be just as harmful when we're talking about empathy. You know, and people need to know they, that they have multiple ways to deliver feedback. I, the worst, and, and you, you can see this, the, the data are out there, um, when, when, when you survey employees and when you survey managers and owners, they always think that they're excellent communicators. And it's something like 97% of employees say, no, 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 it's terrible. There's no pathway to resolution. There's no way to give feedback. Uh, we, we had a feedback uh, box. I, I remember I worked at, at Big Corp when, for a minute. And, and I had, we had a box. And it was just full of like dirty notes and, and naughty, <laughs> naughty sayings and stuff. It, it was a joke, right? And that was the only way to give feedback. Unless, of course, you were a white male who drank after work. Then you could give feedback to the, to the boss that way too. But unfortunately, that wasn't my, so how was I gonna deliver feedback? And so it's important to have multiple channels for accepting that feedback and making sure you let people know that there aren't gonna be consequences or retaliation for, for sharing their, their feedback. You know, at the heart of it all, we, as humans, we're insecure. We struggle with the idea that nobody understands us, our personal relationships. We, we, we struggle in our work. And we really need to act on our, on our empathy and, and authentically connect, not just with our work, but also with people. And, and when you've made that connection to your work and, and, and you can see that problem with, with clarity and understanding, that's when we build the coolest products, the coolest services for our clients. That's when we be, build billion dollar unicorn companies, right? And so as we go through the rest of the conference, I really want you to, to stop and think about how you're connecting with the people around you. If you have anxiety, you know, then maybe it means you just pause for 60 seconds. You take a breath, right? If you think you might be judging someone else because they're not behaving how you would, then just stop and think about the areas in your life where you are maybe doing that same behavior, right? And if you notice that you have a lot of negative thoughts, maybe just stop and focus on something beautiful 
to balance out those thought patterns a little bit. And the more that we tap into our capacity for empathy, it's, it, it, we become closer to realizing our fullest potential for love, for success, and for the acceptance of those who are different from us. So my call to action is this. Please do your best to stay sensitive in a desensitized world. Lean in even harder to your own humanity because empathy is your superpower. And, and with great power comes great responsibility. So use it wisely. Use it excitedly without reservation. If I can do it, so can you. Because how can we create a peaceful world? One heart at a time. Thank you. Thank you.